Hello, good evening and welcome to the Majority Show, which is normally broadcast live every Wednesday night. Um, but welcome to Thursday for once and change. Um, I'm Mark Devlin. I'm the host tonight on Scotland's number one anti-nationalist show. I'm here tonight with my co-hosts, uh, David Griffiths and Mary Devlin. What are we going to be talking about tonight, David? Tonight, I will be asking the question, who is really pulling the SNP strings at Holyrood? And I'll be talking about the Scottish government's war on cars. Okay, and I'll be talking to the Glasgow cabbie. Um, and, yeah, and of course, and of course, we have Zoomer of the Week. Yep, right, all that and much more uh, coming up shortly. Right, well, welcome back to the Majority Show, Scotland's number one anti-nationalist show. I apologise for not being able to uh, be on the show yesterday. I was crawling around the floor in my bedroom in agony with some kind of intestinal problem, which miraculously seemed to disappear late in the evening. So anyway, good news is that I'm I'm better. I'd like to thank you for all your messages of support. Very kind of you to do so. Um, you know what that shows, Mark? It shows that the SNP's voodoo doll actually does work. Uh, well, we just, that's what it felt like, I'll tell you, like that. Like right. stabbing, someone's stabbing me right in the... Right in there. And if you start to have that out, that's what it was. She was in there. She yeah, was in there, in there in Butte House with a wee doll, with just like me, <laughs> and a wee resign sturgeon t shirt on. Yeah, it's it's like, it, it was cranky with a doll. <laughs> die, die. <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. anyway. So, um, thank you all for your messages. That's very kind of you. We have a great show um, for you tonight. Uh, we have a chat with the Glasgow cabbie. But first, a few things that we usually do at the start of the show. Um, this is 2023, and we would like you very much if you could support the show with a donation. Um, we are, our target is to get. 200 people to donate five pounds or ten pounds a month it's not really a lot of money but i know times are um tight we do all kinds of things with that billboard campaigns uh advertising uh, articles memes social media oh, a whole load of stuff so we're quite busy and we'd like you to help uh, keep us busy uh, doing that indeed and, <laughs> well, we do, we do work pretty much full time in the majority. So if you could please pledge a monthly or one time donation at our website, everything else, everything helps. Even five pounds a month builds up. Indeed. Okay. And of course, alternatively, guys, you can show someone you really love them by getting them an exclusive resign Thurgeon mug or T-shirt. What do you think? How do I look? Oh, yes, and, very good. Thank you. And all at very reasonable prices and a little bit from the seal of each one helps to support the show. So... Always a good idea. And we'd also like to thank our friends at UK Union Voice and United Against Separation for supporting the show by letting us broadcast directly to their Facebook pages from where I know a lot of you will be watching this evening. And, of course, we have to say every week, please, if you are watching this on YouTube or elsewhere, please do... Uh, please do subscribe to the show. Uh, many of you who are watching don't actually subscribe, so you don't get alerts. And you and some of you are watching Twitter. If you're watching this on Twitter right now, you can't chat. So please go mm -hmm. to YouTube where you can join the chat. Indeed. And wherever you are, please like, share, comment, tell your friends, extend our reach right at the click of one button. And I will be handling the comments as usual tonight. So please try to keep them short and I'll get as many of them up on screen as I can. Thank you. Right, so coming up in a little while, Mary's been talk, going to talk about the SNP's war on the car. David is going to ask if SNP MPs and MSPs always need to have a script when they talk. But coming up after mm -hmm. the break, we are going to be having an exclusive interview with the Glasgow cabbie. So we'll see you in just a second. Well, the big news for this week is that Sturgeon's uh, gender bill was blocked using a Section 35 order by the UK government. Concern was that the legislation would uh, impact UK equalities law. 
Um, we'll talk more about that at the end of, after we talk to Cabby. Um, but we have this interview uh, with uh, Steph Shaw, who uh, who has become known to many of you uh, for his activities, uh, including setting up demonstrations and so on, and mainly about protecting children from the SNP's um, sexual deviancy, it seems, at some point. So we recorded this on Tuesday, so uh, we hope you like it. Right, we're here today with uh, Steph Shaw, who is known to many of you as the Glasgow cabbie. And uh, with all the news about the gender bill being blocked, uh, he's being uh, he's been very vocal about uh, getting support against the bill and also against indoctrination of, of school children. Steph, thank you for coming to the show today. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, maybe many of our viewers have heard of you, but can you tell us a little bit about how you get started, for those who don't? Well, I've been in social media and Facebook for around um, seven and a bit years, and I just basically started through my poetry and promoting Glasgow and Scotland. It would be about a year and a half, possibly closer to two years ago now, where I um, was sent a, a, a link, a video link, to uh, Richard Lucas of the Scottish Family Party um, challenging John Swinney at a parents meeting in Perth. And I was absolutely shocked to see um, what was shown in that video, which were um, many parents um, shouting down Richard Lucas for challenging John Swinney. And uh, I could barely believe it, but um, I was greatly impressed with and by Richard and uh, extremely disappointed with the parents who were shouting him down as he had been explaining what was going on in sex education within schools in Scotland. Is there a momentum to what you're doing? Yes, without a doubt, Mark. Um, in the last month alone, I got a notification from Facebook today that uh, we've had a further 1,700 new followers this month. Oh, That's okay. significant. Um and a lot of people are following me. An awful lot of people are actually leaving um, the SNP, their membership and the, and the SNP group uh, and coming to follow the Glasgow Cabbie Facebook page. We actually went along to a demonstration that you had in uh, Holyrood uh, just last week uh, against, which seemed to combine a, a, a number of different groups um, that you've you've brought together, uh, people who are against the ch kids' indoctrination, uh, people who are against sex surveys and so on, people who, uh, uh, groups that are various groups as well, against the gender reform bill. Um, how did you think that demonstration went? I thought it was fantastic. We had a brilliant turnout. Um, we invited all groups along who had any grievance with Nicola Sturgeon um, or the Scottish government, so all were welcome. Uh, hence the reason we had so many placards and flags um, from various groups. And uh, I thought all in all, people were very well behaved and it went extremely well. What do you think about um, the UK government blocking the gender reform bill? Well, I thought it was right and proper. It was the correct thing to do um, for the British government to block this bill. Uh, also, you know, we had felt that it was very, or sorry, extremely necessary that this bill should be blocked. This bill was possibly the most dangerous that I've seen since showing an interest in politics um, over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, for women and children, certainly, this bill is dangerous. And how, well, what's the main danger you see in the bill? Well, it's not so much um, the LGBT community. I don't have any problem with people dressing as whatever they want to dress as or identifying um, f and, and anything, anything they want to identify yourself as. Feel free to do that, I say. Let, let, live and let live. But when it infringes on other people's rights, then we have a problem. And we certainly have a problem with um, convicted criminals um, or those who are masquerading as uh, transgender people. That is a real danger and a threat to women. Um, and also we have a real problem with convicted criminals, um, perhaps in prison, uh, wishing to then... Um, become transgender and change their name 
to serve time in a women's prison and perhaps be released from prison to a women's refuge centre where we have some of the most vulnerable people um, in these places. So, yes, uh, we see it as extremely dangerous um, for women and children, mainly girls in this country. Do you think that uh, transgender people are being used as a as a tool, I suppose, by Nicola Sturgeon to cause more division in Scotland? There's no doubt in my mind that uh, Nicola Sturgeon has set out to do that. We've got a, a real problem within the Scottish government that an awful lot of these people who are uh, willing to bring this law in um, don't have children of their own. There just doesn't seem to be enough concern by the Scottish government over the rights of parents, the rights of women, any other group. And it seems that it, it, it just this small group, um, the concern only with a small group. And of course, we, we also say as well, it's just a big distraction. We actually have real things to deal with in Scotland. We have cost of living crisis, energy crisis. Um, we have NHS crisis, all of these caused by the uh, SNP's poor administration anyway. So, I mean, to some extent, they're using this uh, bill as a distraction from the actual day-to-day -day issues they should be dealing with. And now they've got the opportunity to use this, uh, the blockage of it by the UK government, again, as another big distraction. I mean, is that, do you feel it's like that a little bit? There's, it, it's that people are they're playing a higher level of politics with this? Um, yes, I would, I would have to agree with you, Mark. They are tiddling about with something they should not be near. Um, and it could well be a cover for many of the other failures of this Scottish government. Because let's make no mistake about it, we've never seen a government in Scotland quite like this. No. This country is in a dire situation. And um, to make matters worse, we seem to be channeling our energies on um, sex education for children yeah. when it shouldn't be an issue we should be challenging all the other major problems we have in this country. But in the meantime, we must um, battle hard against what the Scottish government are attempting to do. Um, and we must protect women, children and vulnerable people in Scotland mm -hmm. at all costs. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming to see us today. Um, we will monitor your progress, of course, and you're welcome to come on the show anytime and have a chat about how things progress. All right. It's been great to have you today. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Thank Bye -bye you. Now. Right, well, that was um, Glasgow Cabby. That was just the seven minutes of the interview. We have a full 15-minute interview that will be on uh, our YouTube page, which I've got a wee picture of here, YouTube page there, majority YouTube page. Uh, in about uh, seven minutes, it's going to go on automatically, so you can see the rest mm -hmm. of what he was talking about, some very interesting stuff in there, more background about his interesting yeah his interesting background as a poet and how his poetry actually helped save lives um for people who are thinking of committing suicide by jumping into the river clyde which is right. quite something actually so we sometimes say you know words do um, have power um so please also uh, check out his facebook page um as well uh, i think i might have that even here just give me a second uh facebook page yep this is it uh we go here we go Facebook page. Here he has uh, 20 odd thousand, 29,000 followers, and uh, it's good, definitely worth um, following that one as well. He's also on Twitter. Hey, if you're on Twitter, you'll be able to find him easily enough. What did you think about that? What he was saying there, David? Well, I mean, this is the first time I've seen video footage of the cabin. I've never been at a demonstration where he's uh, actually been uh, holding forth. So massively impressed. I think he's doing a, a, a wonderful job, a, a great job at taking this crucial issue to the streets, quite literally. And it's some really hard hitting stuff there, absolutely essential stuff that he's covering. And he's clearly not afraid to turn over stones and uh, find what's what's beneath them. So this is essential stuff in the fight against nationalism. So really sure I missed this demo, but I will certainly be at future events. So very, very impressed indeed. Um, well, yes, I was well, at the, ahead. I mean, I was, I was at the demo with Mark and I was impressed by the, the range of people who were there. I mean, the people were there to uh, demonstrate in all kinds of different issues. 
Um, there were groups of like Muslim women there. There were other people who were really against the sex surveys in schools. Mm. Um, there were other people who who, do, who don't like, um, you know, the way the education, they believe it's more indoctrination and so on. So it was really great to see such a, a number of, you know, diverse people there. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that struck me as well, how many different types of people were there. Perhaps I think as time goes on, we're going to see more of these demonstrations um, and uh, also what getting wider wider numbers of people in. It's not just about necessarily being against a particular bill or so on, but just against the general malaise that Nicola Sturgeon has brought to Scotland. Yeah. Um, of course, it's now clear that the bill is about fomenting a grievance with the UK because Sturgeon had three possible options. The first one, uh, when it was blocked. The first one was to drop the bill entirely. That's a bit unlikely. The second one yeah. was to amend the bill, take the bill back, say, okay, yeah, it does impact UK equalities law. We'll amend it. We'll also take more consideration of uh, women's uh, issues, uh, women's concerns, and um, we'll still get something through for trans people as well. Um, and the third option was to fight it in the courts. Now, of course, if she fights it in the courts, then she loses, then they, lo they lose the bill entirely. So trans people don't get any benefit from that at all. Of course, which which of those three options do you think she chose, David? Oh, needless to say, the First Minister plumped for option C, another meaningless and wholly unnecessary legal battle with the UK government. And as uh, MP Lee Anderson put in the House of Commons, I think yesterday, the Gender Recognition Reform Bill is a cynical attempt by the SNP to use young people on their pathetic pathway to independence. Couldn't have put it better myself. We all see you, Mr. Sturgeon. We know exactly what you're playing at. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, it seems that the, the, the way their playbook has been recently, without any real ideas, is that they'll create laws that exceed yeah. the, the powers that they were given to the Scottish devolved administration. And then when the UK blocks it, they'll go, ah, Westminster bad. Yeah. And the democracy, you know, we're, the, we're the upholders of democracy, a most ridiculous concept, uh, you know, when they've denied the results of two referendums and continue on this ridiculous de democracy denying thing with like the de facto referendum and even like, ALBA people are like UDI. It's like... These are not defenders of democracy in any way. No. Meanwhile, they just do not do anything with the day job at all. Yes. Right, and they just keep rinsing and repeating this idea. We'll just we'll, we'll distract everyone with this, uh, you know, referendum bill. First of all, then we'll distract everyone with this uh, gender bill, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's so tiresome. Yeah. It's true. I love this idea that anybody who's speaking out against this bill is anti-trans. No, it's like saying if you criticise the SNP for not building ferries, you're anti-sailor. It's just ridiculous. It just happens to be the subject matter, you know. <laughs> okay. the, the, the objection of the UK government is on the operation of this law within the context of the UK Equalities Act. And the UK government warned them several times and they didn't engage at all. This is just chickens coming home to roost. This is what happens if you pass bad laws and ignore the reserved issues upon which they impact. So completely predictable, completely avoidable, and all done deliberately to stoke grievance, nothing else. Well, yes, and thanks for that comment, Rita. Um, but the question I have is that why is this allowed to happen in the first place? Why is yeah. uh, Scotland allowed to make gender laws that d d are different from the rest of the UK? And I mean, yeah. now you can even widen this out. Why are we getting di do we have different taxes and so on? These are just recipe for disaster. And you know, it's I think perhaps Labour and you know certain Conservatives, Adam Tompkins, for example, and uh, yeah. some of the other ones, they're like just give them more powers and and they'll comply. But what they do is they use these powers to. You divide even more now. Yep. They just it almost seems it's deliberate. They say they pick a wedge issue and they try and get people and they try to put it up to the Westminster government. When the Westminster government says no, as it should, rightly should, because let's get the primary government, then the 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 they are um they go, Oh, you know, Westminster bad and so on. Hmm. It's um, well, we've got Mr. Tommy Boy is saying, I see it as like the Lord sending a bill back to the House of Commons which must happen fairly regularly. It's mm. time Holyrood was held to account. That's the problem, isn't it, that we don't have a second house? Well, I think someone mentioned this the other day, and I said, well, you know, the UK government should actually be the second house. Mm. You know, we don't need more. The last thing we need is more Another politicians. House, yeah. We're already over-governed as it is. Um, 
You know, I put out this tweet the other day. It's got over 2,000 likes. It says, the majority of Scots don't want different laws and taxes from the rest of the UK. We just want the potholes fixed and the bins emptied. We don't want gen different gender laws. We don't want these tax, ta different tax bans, different... Different, all this different stuff. They we're supposed to be in one country, and the, the, it's just, it's just, it causes so much problems and allows these people to create more and more grievance over stuff Absolutely. as well. It's, it's, it's just, it's really shocking here. I mean, yeah, I wonder I, if yeah. that's. Go ahead, go ahead. David. There should clearly be a review of reserved issues and devolved issues because that's, that's, that's what we should do. Well, the SNP are always talking, or ALBA, and those are always talking about a constitutional convention. Perhaps you know one should be drawn up to say to actually you know, bring the bring the powers back a bit more and say because the major this is the thing the majority of Scots don't vote for the SNP. So mm. we've had this for how many years now? We're a, we're a minority. Uh, mm. Government, a minority of people have taken control of the government and are enacting laws that the majority of Scots don't actually want. It's true. Right. So, you know, this and, and, and areas that they don't want them to be meddled with as well. So it's a time somehow. First, they need to fix this electoral system. It's a disaster for a start. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we start saying the UK government, as the, certainly as the SNP get weaker, nationalism gets weaker, um, needs to start pulling back some powers at some point. And I think perhaps this is the start of this. The first, the first time the SNP are worried that from now uh, that... Um, the UK government can veto any bill using a Section 35. I don't actually think that's the case, but I think mm. what it does do is it says that UK government now finally feels strong enough to fight the SNP and maybe on a range of issues. Yes. Well, one thing we haven't touched on in this discussion is about the Labour and Lib Dems who supported. Yeah, we're going to talk about that near, near, the, near the end. Okay. There's going to be a big section on that in, in the Zoomer of the Week, which we'll be looking forward to. Okay. So, um, I mean, really, is this what Donald Dewar intended when he set up the Scottish Assembly? Was it to tax Scots more, destroy local services, yeah. enable nationalism, put extremist Greens in power, waste billions and destroy women's rights? Great job, Donald. Yeah. And not only that, it costs £600 million a year for these decisions. That's £6 billion over the past 10 years uh, to enact policies that the majority of Scots don't want. £6 yeah, yeah. billion. Pounds. That's a lot of ferries. Well, that is a lot of ferries, Mary. Mm. Just think how many ferries they could fail to finish with that money. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So... Well, we all know um, we, are, we are not big fans of the way things are going, but perhaps the, the, the worm has turned, perhaps. And I think big kudos to uh, Alistair Jack, because yeah. we, one of the things we were worried about was that Rishi Sunak would be a bit softy-softy with mm. uh, yeah. um, nationalists. And Alistair Jack seems to have been given the go-ahead to push back on this. And I think it does signal that the, S the UK government thinks the SNP finally week and of course she doesn't have any support for this with many of her own supporters that's true that's true that i mean the, the wings um opinion poll said i think 80 percent of snp voters uh, or, or independence backers were against it 80 percent against that's unprecedented unprecedented as uh, Nicholas <laughs> yes <Rachel. laughs> well you know i mean i mentioned this last week and it's the the idea that somehow that they they're they're, they're asking the uk government you know, for help, yeah. and then they turn around next. You know, they'll turn a month or so, and they'll be like, "Oh, but we still want independence." You know, like, well, you just get saved by yeah. the very government you want to destroy. No, I, no, no. So I mean, nationalism hasn't been done right. We need a real nationalist in power, uh, not Nicola Sturgeon. And uh, you know, but that's the way it is. Yeah. Well, it's Alex Salmond or whoever. It always ends up this way. It's true. I mean, the, the the greatest one was when they were saying we want to be independent, but can you just extend furlough a bit longer first? I mean, uh -huh. Yeah, right. Okay, we want to be independent, but give us some money. Would you mind? Go on. Well, it's like I said it before. It's cakeism. You know, they have to want yeah. to have their cake and eat it. And you see though that that survey wasn't that long ago, and it basically said oh, it was a big list, laundry list of things that. People who actually were nationalists wanted to keep. You want to keep the currency, you want to keep right. the, the military and all this stuff. You're like, well, why bother then? Exactly. It's not nationalism. Not, and I think more and more people are actually see, beginning to see that, beginning to see two things. They're beginning to see that the SNP is a disaster. And, they're, and the next part is that, that you know, the nationalism itself, no, the Scottish government is a, disa a disaster mm -hmm. and the devolved Scottish government. And then what we want them to see is that nationalism itself is the cause. Yeah. 
nationals. The idea that you want independent Scotland is what allows these incompetent authoritarians, uh, cynical politicians, into power. That's the core of it. So Absolutely. you have to get rid of that idea. Quite okay. right. We've got, we've got to make nationalism as deeply unpopular on a gut level as it should be, and as it is everywhere else, apart from well, Scotland. Well, it is. You know, even yeah. another, there was another one there. It's, you know, I'm not a nationalist, but... Exactly. You know, I, I want an independent Scotland. You're like, no, I don't think so. I don't want to hear Right. It. Okay, well, it meant much to talk about. This GRA thing will go on a long time. Um, we'll see how it goes, but definitely the uh, nationalists were, are on the back foot. Coming up, uh, David's going to talk about shadowy figures behind the scenes at Holyrood. Did you mm -hmm. write that bit there? Okay. Indeed. And uh, Mary's <laughs> wondering if we're all going to be walking to work soon. So we'll be back in a sec. Right, David, you're up. Okay, so in recent weeks, as I think we've all seen, it's become very noticeable that SNP MPs and MSPs are all always reading from prepared scripts. And it's almost like I have a question to ask, and it's just pathetic. It's obviously not on top of what they're actually reading. Now, you can, ex to an extent, you can understand people when they're answering questions, um, saying, maybe referring to notes, particularly if it's something that's a little bit complicated. But what we're seeing now is, Every SNP MP and M or not so much, but certainly every SNP MP is referring to prepared scripts when they're asking questions. Now, if you've got a question, you don't need to check your your notes. Surely you know what your question is. So, like in the parliamentary discussion of the Section Thirty Five Order um, row, Kirsten Oswald, Kirsty Blackman, Philippa Whitford, Alison Thiel, they all stood up full of indignation and they read their questions out literally like this, reading like this, not even looking up at all. So clearly I had no idea what they were asking. And at one stage, Alison Thiel actually started reading a statement from her mobile phone in the House of Commons. It was just dreadful. So to my mind, if you're being asked a, a lengthy, uh, you've got to get a lengthy answer to a complex question, sure, refer to some notes, but not in asking a question, particularly not on a topic like section 35 for the GRR bill about which each SNP MSP seems so vexed. So what, what I, mean, I, I have an idea of what I think is behind this. What would your thoughts, Mark, would you say on why, why this is? Well, I didn't have much time to pray for this one, but I, I think, <laughs> I think it's, um, <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, it's because they all want to be, don't want to make any mistakes, yep. right? And they yep. don't want to go off script because if in the SNP, their constitution says you're not allowed to criticise another member. And they're all worried that if they go off script in some minor way, that they'll be pulled up. They'll get a bollocking or bollock. What's that, that right word? Anyway. A, a rollicking. Or a yeah, rollicking or one of those yeah. words. Yes. So yes. one of those one of those type of words. And you know, they're just, you know, they're, they're, I think they're scared, really. And they don't yeah. have any really great orators there. Nicholas Sturgeon, for example, isn't a great orator. Orator, even. Orator. And, no, she's not. Um, Blackford is just a bore. Yeah. And the new guy, you know, is like Skeletor or something. Not very interesting. You know, oh, he's it looks like death. Death cooled down. He so does. I mean, <laughs> they're they're not really like a you know an interesting bunch. And yeah, I think they need to have some. I mean, and certainly we compare with someone like say Penny Mordaunt or something yeah. like that. It's like you know, on it. You just, it's true. You know, and it's it seems almost natural. You know. Absolutely, and they seem effortless in their ability to, to get their points across, the, certainly the Conservative MPs in the House. But funnily enough, a potential answer came up to the question I'm about to ask just today. Because the big question, of course, is if all SNP MPs and MSPs require written questions to do their job, who's writing the questions for them? Is it spads? Ah, yes. Indeed, could it be? So remember that these MPs and MSPs are supposedly Scotland's representatives in Parliament. We are voting for them. They're elected on the basis of their ability to go and represent the lives of millions of people and make decisions on that very basis. But they're not able to perform even the most simple task of reading some of, or actually speaking some words. So who's doing this? Who's writing the questions? Or could it be, for example, it can't be Nicola Sturgeon, because we, as, as we know, she in FMQ, she just reads head down from typed, prepared scripts, every question. Um, but so could it be Peter Morell or could it be Mike Russell? Mike Russell, party president. Uh, did you notice this, guys? His Twitter account has been suspended. Mike Russell. Oh, yeah, someone mentioned that to me, well, actually. Why did it get suspended? It, it doesn't say, just as he's, he's contravened Twitter rules. But Russell, <laughs> although he is quite a passably good orator, um, if he's, he he has also got a bad temper and he does get riled quite a lot. I've, I've uh, gotten under his skin several times. But today... The Times ran an article which suggested a possible answer. And, are, and that potential answer is, are we seeing the SNP governing at the behest or in cahoots with 
lobby groups. I mean, this is just quite incredible. So I've gone for the articles there, Mark. Have you got yeah, it's, up, it's up now? Cool, cool, cool. Right, okay. So um, the idea that the question here was um, the, the Times said there are several charities and civic groups which were most vociferous in criticizing the Westminster's decision to uh, raise a, a S35 in, 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 a, in, a, in an attempt to block the Holy Regenda recognition laws. Now, these charities and groups all receive funds, millions of pounds, some of them, in funds from the SNP administration. 14 groups signed a, sta a statement expressing strong opposition to the S35. An analysis by the Times in the article showed that 12 of these organisations which supported the First Minister's stance on the issue were funded either in whole or in part by the Scottish yep. government or yeah, else. Shocking. So we're seeing here now, normally you see the government acting at the behest of lobbyists who pay them, but we are now seeing the government <laughs> Paying lobbyists. I mean, what is what is going on? I've never seen this before. I've literally never heard of that. So, as an unnamed academic pointed out today in the article, the political impartiality of these groups and these charities is thus dubious, and this general situation is very unhealthy for Scottish democracy. Well, I would call that masterly understatement. You're, if the Scottish government's governing on behalf of unelected lobby groups, which are recipients of eye-watering sums from the Scottish government, we are into very, very dangerous territory here, guys. This is like something you'd expect to see in, I don't know, Mexico or something in the 1970s, but not in Scotland today. So. Well, a banana republic without the bananas. Indeed. So um, kudos to the Times for finding this. Absolutely and watering stuff and very very much one to keep an eye on there is something very very dodgy going on with these groups and with the questions being asked and that's to my mind why these people have no idea what they're asking or what they're asking them for so that is behind it. it's not just that they're incapable which they are they're also at it that's my firm belief at <laughs> it. That's, that's it. the scottish government is at, at it, it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. that's, uh, you that's my political you know. analysis for you guys <laughs> Well, I think it's. I think this is the thing with the capture of the third sector by the government is is something that's really uh, it's been ongoing for quite some time. We talked yeah. before about uh, someone we know who uh, is involved in the arts in Scotland, yeah. and they were not able to get funding for projects. Or actually, what they said first of all, they weren't able to get funding for their projects. But second, because of the political affiliations. But the second yeah. part was that any project that was like, say, a play or a movie about Scotland had to include something about Scottish independence in the actual content. And that's, you know, when you see that thing where uh, Angus Robertson, is it? He has the budget for the the, the constitution. What's well, the constitution, yes. culture, and media? I think it's three hundred million mm. pounds, right? right. Three hundred fifty odd million pounds, right? And we always say, well, you know, the the issue is with the the part for the constitution, which means uh, they're going to use that on uh, a fake referendum or whatever. Yeah. But there's another hundreds of millions of pounds that they're putting into stuff, buying favors from third sector organisations uh, all around. And it's a corruption of civil society because these people, the payroll vote, as it were, first of all, they'll vote for the, they always vote for the person who gives them money. Yeah. And then they can be used, in this case as well, like 12 groups out of 14 are supporting this, uh, this are against this S35 action. But yeah. when the bill was being made, they were the ones that were pushing the bill to begin with. There you go. Yeah. And they were first out of the blocks to say, oh, my God, you can't do this. UK government clearly working hand in, in glove with the, the SNP government here. Very, very dodgy. One of the questions there was, so the, the, the SNP government is giving taxpayers money to lobby groups. Yes, they are. Clearly they are. Yeah. Unbelievable well, stuff. Yeah. I mentioned this to someone earlier on today and they said, and I said, well, why are governments giving money to charities anyway? And the person said, well, you know, they give money to, uh, you know, various, uh, not like national opera and type yeah. of things like that. But generally those are not political. Uh, That's scope. true. But they've become political in Scotland and the government is is funding these these groups that are then saying, they're funding groups that then propose and support the government's own thing. And that's a very right. dangerous thing in civil society, Absolutely. I think. These well, groups should actually be against the government. Quite right. I mean, imagine so, charities in, in the UK and in, in, around London acting on, on, on behalf of, of Richie Sunak or Boris Johnson. My God, can you imagine what the Labour Party and the SNP mm, would say? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Mary, you're up. 
<laughs> no, I was just, um, Kenny had I'd put up the thing on the screen. I just wanted to talk about that. Kenny was saying that Leo Kers is mm -hmm. blacklisted from the stand comedy clubs run by Tommy Shepard. And Tommy, Tommy Shepard was the only person during COVID who yep. got the maximum amount yep, of true. grant of £250,000 from yeah. the government. Club. For a comedy for club. club. For his club, comedy club, yeah. Which nobody could go to. You know. A quarter of a million pounds. Yes. Well, and, of course, he's hmm. against Leo Kirst because Leo Kirst doesn't go along with the national, nationalist uh, yeah. agenda. Well, it's a big thing in the United States, for example. If you get any government money, you have to – You all comers, everyone's all – has to come. I remember there was a case where people wanted some, – some, some bunch of extremists actually wanted to put a sign on the side of a bus. And in Scotland, they would never have allowed that this no. side but because of the first amendment and because of that it was publicly owned they had to put the message on the side of the bus so stuff stuff like that if you, you're taking public money you should be working for the public not for the government absolutely right anyway mm -hmm. great section there uh david thank you very much for yeah. that um coming up the snp is and the scottish government and the greens let's put it that way mm -hmm. are waging a war on the motorist mary is going to tell us more about that Okay, so tonight I want to talk about the Scottish government war on cars. They don't want us being free to drive around. They want us living our lives in small 20-minute neighbourhoods, as they're called, where we have to walk or use bikes. And if we do try to travel outside that restricted area, they want us to use public transport. Uh, we know this because last week the net zero minister did – I mean, do we all know that we have a net zero minister? <laughs> Another one, 110 or so ministers that we have. Getting 110,000 Getting 110,000 pounds a year, yeah. Um, anyway, our net zero minister is Michael Matheson. And he announced to Holyrood that the Scottish government were looking to cut down on car usage throughout most of Scotland's towns and cities. I don't know if you've got that. Yeah, I have that here. Yeah. On transport, our second strategic transport projects review, published just two weeks ago, confirms that the era of catering for unconstrained growth in private car use is well and truly over. The review follows the sustainable, the sustainable investment hierarchy, which aims to reduce the need to travel unsustainably and prioritises making best use of enhancing existing infrastructure before investing in new capacity. Furthermore, we have set out how we will reduce car kilometres by 20% by 2030 in our draft route map, a truly world-leading commitment demonstrating oh our level of ambition in meeting Scotland's statutory targets. We'll just leave that there. So he's, he said that they want to reduce um, people's car kilometres by 20%. Now, in Glasgow, it's actually 30%. Oh, really? And he talks about not investing in any new infrastructure. You have to look at what you've existing got. But in Glasgow, they're trying to cut the kilometres by 30%. And they've estimated that this is going to cost £475 million. Wow, right, so that really? sounds like quite an investment in infrastructure. Um, right. Now, bearing in mind that today, we've just seen that the Glasgow City Council are talking about cutting 800 teachers' jobs and they're going to do away with kids' swimming lessons at school. Oh, So yeah. let's just be clear about what the priorities are here, guys. Well, that's the thing. We've talked about this a lot. They've, they want to they prioritise all these policies that don't actually affect, either don't affect many people or just annoy people because it are not being used. I mean, look at these bike lanes. Or bike lane. I'm actually, I don't, I'm not I care about the bike lanes if they were used. But people are not using them, or if they were kept clean, they were covered in trash and so on. Well, we don't, we that... don't have the weather for them. No, I mean, we don't. No, we have that. That's sake. absolutely true. Yeah, you can't go to IKEA on a bike. You know, what <laughs> I mean? you, can't get, a... you can't get much back with you on a bike. Well, I, guess. I suppose you can go, but you can't come back, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the public transport network isn't worthy anyway of of, of being used on mass by everybody because you can't get for a start. The trains are in strike every five minutes, and then the buses. The bus routes just aren't, um, what's the word, comprehensive enough. It's just doomed to fail. But the idea of us going back to these like um, Stone Age little dwelling places, I mean, how ridiculous, isn't it, really? Well, that's exactly um, what they are aiming for. So yeah. I don't know if, if everyone's heard about this new vision for what they call, it's a bit confusing, 15-minute cities and 20-minute neighbourhoods. Oh, 
So basically, they want to make sure that everybody has all the services they need on a day-to-day basis. If you live in a neighborhood, it'll be within 20 minutes. So you can walk or, uh, I guess, cycle in 20 minutes to the services that you need in your area. Or if you live in a city, it would be within 15 minutes. Um, And I know this is something that is not just happening in Scotland. It's happening in other places. Like There's a trial going on next year in Oxford. I don't know if you've got that up. Mark I the, have that. Yes, hold on a second. Let me get that there. Uh, Mira, where is it here? Yep, Oxford. This is the this is the famous one here. Yeah. So in Oxford, they're going to trial these fifteen minute neighbourhoods. So what they're basically doing is they're carving up Oxford, which isn't I don't think a very big city. I think they're carving no. it into six different areas, and you won't be allowed to travel within the different areas or you're you've, you're given a certain number of times. I think it's a hundred <coughs> times in a year that you're allowed to go from your area into one of the other neighbourhoods in Oxford. In a car, I guess this is, right? Yes. Yes, in a car. Yeah. Yeah. So if you happen to live in one neighbourhood and say your elderly mother or something that you're looking after lived in one of the other ones, you would only be allowed to take your car over there 100 times in a year. So I don't know how Absolutely. to do the, the counting or whatever, but I think that well, that's part. That's the other part of it is that they put in a massive surveillance network there, yeah. and basically, I was watching a thing about it today, and the guy was saying, "Well, okay, they start with a hundred. You're allowed a yeah. hundred times visit, but then it goes to eighty, then it goes to fifty, twenty, and then yeah. after a while you can't move because they say, no, you're an evil car owner. You should not be allowed to move at all. In fact, the very fact you've got a car you should, means you're not suitable to be part of our idea of society. Right, That's right. basically where they're going. And so, but the thing is, I, we were talking about this earlier, and I think it should be the opposite way around. I think it should be encouraging more people to go into the city centres with their cars and putting more car parks there and letting people go in. Otherwise, people, if you just if you just say. No, you can't go in or it's going to cost more. Well, where are you going to go? You're going to drive further to go exactly. to somewhere else. Yep. Exactly. Uh, well, the way that well, you might not be able to do that because the way that they're going to enact this, I guess, you know, trying to get everyone to live in their little 20 minute walking radius is that they're going to control planning. So there's going to be they're going to they're going to impose strong opposition to planning applications. So if you're trying to be an out of town retail park or a drive-through fast food restaurant, or, you know, and they're going to limit the number of spaces uh, for cars in city centres as well. So basically all the choices will be taken away from you. So you will be living in your neighbourhood because there'll be no point in going out, you know, they've limited everything that's outside your neighbourhood. Absolutely. Remember during COVID, the Greens actually specified they were against drive-throughs. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because yeah. of tire degradation. Or something. Well, no. They, they, what they say is it's because of emissions, basically. First of all. Yeah. And then they just use anything after that. They say it doesn't matter. It's not going to matter if you get a if you buy an electric car. Now, I think electric cars are great. Many people will disagree with that. Of course, they have their issues with charging and range and yep. so on with that. Yep. But if we're going around the town, great things. I don't have one. I'd like one. Okay. And the manufacturers are all changing to electric cars. Yeah, um, but I've lost my train. I thought <laughs> and this, um, oh yeah but the even w- w- they said that even if you have an electric car they'll just mm. they'll continue with this idea that you're polluting with tire degradation and tire particles they'll never ever stop because it's not no. about pollution no, it's, it's all not. about control they want to control where you move i've said this a few times in the show my my dad always said the rich People don't want you to travel around. They don't want you to associate, and they don't want you to, you know, they don't, they don't want you to, they don't want you to have the freedom that they have. And it's not just necessarily the rich anymore. It's just people want control over other people. Yes, well, I mean, there's concern that they're wanting to ban all. I mean, eventually they're going to want to ban all cars completely from the road. But um, what's going on in Scotland is being noticed in other countries. Uh, in North America, for example, there's a couple, few commentators. One of the most notable is Jordan um, Peterson. Oh, yeah. And he basically came on Twitter to, he blasted Matheson's announcement. And he said, do you want to keep your car? even more basically your right to autonomous mobility, then pay attention because the globalist utopians seriously have other plans. Mm -hmm. So what's 
yeah, Scotland is just jumping on the bandwagon with this, aren't they? Well, um, I, I think I hate this thing when they say this is the thing that really gets my goat is when they say we're doing world leading stuff. Mm. Rubbish. And you're like, why? Why? You're like, why do we need to be world leading? In <laughs> why this? do you need to yeah. be world leading? I, you know, I'd rather you were average and didn't annoy everyone in the country. Yeah, right. or I'd rather you were average and didn't spend all this money unnecessarily. I'd rather you we were just an average region of the UK or country, even if you wanted to say that, just average. Yeah. And we had spent the money instead on our schools and making them world leading. We never hear oh, we've got world leading school, right? Anymore, we never hear no. we've got world leading uh, health yeah. service. No. Because all the money's been spent on world leading bike lanes. Yeah, well, that, that's, right. what, that's where the investment is going to go. <laughs> and I, I, the question says here what about bike tire degradation? Don't, oh, exactly. Don't that's guys. a good point. That's a good point. Indeed, well done, Catherine. Well, mm. And as we all know, that the Glasgow City Council are, are bringing in their LEZ zone yes. next year. So there'll be a lot less cars in Glasgow. But I think they're actually planning to reduce the number of parking spaces and keep all the cars out of the city centre eventually. What are they going to do with shops in the city centre as well? What do we have in the city centre then, guys? Nothing? I don't know. Empty I don't building? Know. Boarded up restaurants like the Regano? Great. Oh, well. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. People just go elsewhere. It's like, if this is too much hassle, I'll go to the out-of-town shopping centre, but they want to close yeah. those down as well or not build new ones. So you're just like, oh, I'm going to be stuck here in, in my, in, uh, without being able, able to go anywhere. Interesting. I don't think they'll ever get to that point. But the thing is, they, yeah. if, we, if we didn't stand up against them, and these people in Oxford are yeah. standing up against them, uh, then they would, they would just roll over us and maybe mention that a little bit later in the show. Very but quickly. Some, Doreen Hopwood has made a brilliant point here. Try getting anywhere on a bus outside of a city. I'll give you an oh. example, Doreen. Tomorrow I'm in Glasgow at lunchtime. I then have to go to Co-Winning and Prestwick. Now, I can either get five buses, literally, from Glasgow to get to um, Co-Winning, or I can go back to Ayr or Prestwick and then drive. I've got no choice. I can't take five buses. I just cannot do that. But that's what the situation is facing me for a very, very short journey. Not good enough. You cannot move the people off roads and out of cars and onto a bus service that's as paltry as that. Uh, Very good point, Dory. Is that, is that yeah. some kind of like bus trip to hell? Yeah. You know, I'm going through really? co-winning and, and uh, co-man. Just winning. No offence to those people <laughs> who live there. Only kidding, um, We love your show. I, yeah, of course. Well, yes, I brought up in co-winning. Mark's from your show. <laughs> yes. oh, I know. I know you were indeed. Spent far too many years there as well yeah. it wasn't too many years later after i'd moved out and came back and my dad said you know kill winning it, you know that means you people from here can't do anything because it'll just their winnings will be killed <laughs> i was like okay right what? dad right dad okay. we can't succeed from because we're from kill winning let's see yeah. well your dad said a lot of wise things i don't <laughs> I know if that was one of them to be honest but... no, no. right okay thanks for that segment mary uh, if you're concerned about the cars uh, the LEZ, I think we should definitely do some action against that. As, as part of my campaign, as some of you may know, that I'm going to be campaigning to become uh, the mayor of Glasgow. So I think right. against this LEZ uh, is a definitely good idea. So I'm going to be contacting some of the groups who are against that. If you know some of those people or people, then please uh, get them in touch with me and I will try and get in touch with them. And perhaps we can do something, get in the paper, whatever, help stop this nonsense. Things you can do to support the show. You can make a monthly donation. That would be great. You can buy a T-shirt or a mug. And the mugs are great, actually. Lots of people buying them at the moment. If you're new to the show and you want to go into demonstration, these are particularly good. Everyone comes up and talks to you. Um, we wear one of these. Uh, you can subscribe to the show on YouTube, which we really like. And you can tell your friends about us uh, failing all that. Or you can do all of the above, which makes us happy. Coming up, it's the highlight of the week. It mm -hmm. is... The amazing and incredible, if I get back to the graphics part, Zoomer of the Week. Hey, David, you're up first. I am. Okay. My nomination for Zoomer of the Week this week is North East Green MSP Maggie Chapman. Maggie this week was interviewed on LBC by Tom Swarbrick to discuss the Gender Recognition uh, Reform Bill and her opposition to uh, the UK government's uh, opposition to it. During her interview, Maggie confirmed her view because she was asked this by Tom 
Is it correct that you think it would be appropriate and beneficial for Scotland's children under 16 to have formal recognition of their chosen gender? When she was asked, uh, and she confirmed that she did indeed. When she was asked if she also believed that a child aged, say, eight should be able to make their own decision about whether to change their sex legally, Maggie replied, I think in principle we should be exploring that. That's word for word what she said. So uh, clearly disbelieving, Swarbrick then said to Maggie, well, does that mean you think the voting age in Scotland should be dropped to eight? And her answer to that, I think we should actually look at how young people are treated across society. I think there's a video here which will prove what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm up, guys. It's, it's quite shocking, this. Yep. You said, and I'm quoting you here, it would be, quote, appropriate and beneficial for children under 16 to have formal gender recognition. Is that to say that you would, you would support, for example, an eight-year-old being able to have their sex legally changed? I, I, I think in the committee that, that scrutinised this legislation, we heard from a wide range of, of trans people who knew well before they were 16 that they were trans. And I think we should be looking at processes where they can be recognised. That does not mean to say I'm saying we, we set an age, an age at, at which it's fine. I think there will need to be much wider discussions around but, protection. But below 16, you're thinking of a child below the age of 16 would have their own decision about yes. whether to change their sex legally. So in theory, an eight-year-old could do that. I, I, th I think in principle, we, sh we should be exploring that. Let us remember that in Scotland, it's the age of legal capacity is currently 16. At 16, people can vote in Scottish Parliament and our local elections. People can get married. Those are, you know, big decisions too. And I think the 16 is absolutely where we should be at the moment. And I would like to explore um, would options. Would you lower the voting age to be eight? I, I think we, we should actually look at how young people in general are treated across society. I think there's a lot of... So in of Scotland, age... you'd like to see eight-year-olds being able to vote and legally change their sex? <coughs> that, is not what I, not, that is not what I said. Please do no, not twist my words. I... Well, that's exactly what she said, isn't it? Indeed, really? indeed it is. So, I mean, uh, just to say, just, I'm just going to interject yeah. in this a little bit. So what she's saying is that she thinks that eight-year-olds have the capacity to change gender, to make medical decisions that yeah. may mutilate their bodies for life. That's what she's saying. That's right. Right? And, well, and that parents can do F all about it. That's what the, she's saying. It's well, abs absolutely disgusting. It really is. It's, it's difficult to believe that this person, I, I, I'm horrified by it. I think she's a, danger, a dangerous extremist indeed. and she should have no place near government or, or children of any kind, in fact. We've got Couldn't some comments, comments here. Um, so Myra's pointing out that um, the Scottish government have said before that uh, children's or young people's adolescence brains are not mature until they're 25 so yes. that's why they they'll put them into adult prisons, I, I believe, at twenty five. Um, well, that's young another, offender, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. There was another one I wanted to bring up here. Where is that? Um, yeah, in Scotland, you're not allowed to use a sunbed until you're sixteen, but you can change you can change sex, but you can't use a sunbed. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so these are just some of the anomalies that are going on in Scotland about the. The thinking I think about she's kids. in jail. That woman is absolutely ridiculous. But what was even more striking, I'll just go through this quickly. Sure. She was asked about, you know, what about if you've got a male sex offender? Should they be able to change their sex legally? And she said, her Maggie's answer was, uh, being asked to remember specifically about male sex offenders, she said, oh, well, if people are trans, they should be recognised legally as who they are. So it was, she was then asked, well, what safeguards are in place? to stop somebody falsely, a man falsely coming to be a woman. She said, oh, don't worry. Any such applications would be fraudulent. So it's just it's just ridiculous. I mean, I don't know if have you get second clip, Mark? No, where she was asked, how are you going to know no, if a man's don't. being fraudulent? Don't worry. No. She was asked, how do you know if a man's being fraudulent? She said, I, 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 she had no answer at all. So according to Maggie, predatory males, don't worry, they won't have to be um, any cause of concern because they will only apply to be considered trans because if they're if to do otherwise would be fraudulent. So you're only going to get genuine applications. Um, and there's zero risk to, to women from predatory men. It doesn't happen. And remember, trans people are not predatory. So what a load of utter rubbish. They keep saying oh, trans people are this. It's not about trans people. The objections here are about stopping people who are falsely claiming to be trans. That's the whole point. And it's as if the SNP can't even comprehend this on the Greens, can't even comprehend the idea that there might be some people out there who might tell lies in order to gain uh, access to women because they like molesting women. Believe me, guys, there are an awful lot of people in this country who do. So well, anyway, they're just generally pervy. Exactly. Yeah, well, there are a lot of crazy people out there. You know, I mean, 
Do you just know? We know. We all know. So, the thing is, we all know. The thing, yeah. that's, we all know there are perverts out there. So we want some reasonable restrictions on these, whether it's going to be a pervert or someone uh, uh, who's genuinely trans. And Quite. those people, you know, that, that's why there's a process to go through. And if you just give anyone a certificate, then you know, don't know who is genuinely trans. This is the part I, this is the part I don't understand. Whereas if you know that someone has taken t- two years, lived for their gender in two years, and, th- and they've got the certificate because, and they've got a diagnosis, then you know that they are genuinely trans. So if they exactly. are in the changing room or whatever it is, you don't, it's, it's fine. But if you just give out certificates like you know, Sweeties, okay, then you don't exactly. know what, who's got them. That's that, which is the whole point. Indeed, Tommy Boy's quite right here also. She was further asked, guys, um, are, are, is anybody, has anybody in history ever been able to change sex, change their chromosome setup? She said, I don't know. I don't know what my chromosome setup is. Do you? Uh, no, no, no. She's a dangerous yeah. extremist and she shouldn't be anywhere near children. At Quite all. right. Thanks yeah, for yeah. that, David. That's, I mean, God, I can't start. I mean, who elected these people? For God God's people sake. In the Northeast, what were you thinking? Young people in the Northeast, please, guys, not again. Don't do this. You think so? Mm. What were you thinking? Right. Okay. Uh, coming up, it's going to be Mary. Okay, for the second week in a row, my Zoomer of the week is another green, Ross Greer, for describing the Scottish countryside as desolate and sterile. (laughs) And he basically believes it's in need of some mega wind turbines. So I know there are 40 shades of green, but I think he has just invented a new one. I mean, what kind of green wants to defile unspoiled, pristine Scottish countryside with industrial wind turbines? And these are no ordinary wind turbines. They're between 720 and 850 feet tall, almost as tall as the Shard in London. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to build hundreds of these all across Scotland. Now, just to give you an idea of the height, if... When these things are built, they will be like the third highest structures in the UK. They're oh. absolutely ginormous. <laughs> okay. And now crazy. Scotland already has 19,000 turbines. Did Far you know too that? Many. 19,000 turbines, which when the wind is blowing right at the right time of day and whatever, um, they can supply 100% of the country's electricity needs. But despite this, the SNP and the Greens, they want to build another... 140 large scale wind farms. Absolutely. So that's not just 140 turbines, that's 140 large scale wind farms. And so they're putting through legislation to overhaul the, the wind farm planning rules to give developers the green light, basically, so that they can build these wind farms. So there used to be protections for, there was a, n- a number of different types of areas that would be protected, um, areas of significant protection, which included, for example, wildland, peatland, world heritage sites, battlefields, and the two kilometre buffer zone around towns and villages. Well, they're going to drop all that now. So you, they will be allowed to put uh wind turbines and wind farms and that type of land. The only land that's going to be protected now is the national parks and the national scenic areas. Well, you have, have one on top of everyone's house. Every single house will have well, a big giant one. You know, it would be fine if you could actually get the power out of them. But the wind doesn't go all the time. We need... There's a, there's some graphics you can find on uh, on on YouTube where they show here one nuclear power station takes up this amount of room. We all know how much space that takes up. Yeah. You know, not much particularly. Size of a factory, say. And yeah. then you've got the, against the same generation by wind turbines, and it's basically the whole of Scotland. And that's what's happened. It's almost like a thought experiment that's gone wrong. Uh, it's... Well, Ross Greer thinks this is okay because he thinks that the Scottish countryside is mostly desolate and sterile. Good so God. people have people have been getting onto him on social media, and someone asked Ross, "Have you ever actually personally visited any unspoilt natural landscape north of Kelvin Grove Park?" <laughs> <laughs> and someone else says, "A few more brain cells, and you might be able to see the visual as well as ecological difference between a grazing sheep and a meters high wind turbine set in a concrete right. base, displacing wildlife and ground and ground peat where it was placed, not to mention roads and other infrastructure. Oh, well, that's actually the, part, the bigger part of the problem is you have to put up the pylons to take the electricity away, mm-hmm. and you have to uh, put the roads in. And a lot, a lot of these hills never have ever had roads in them before. 
Um, and, you know, destruction of peat bogs and what have you. I don't mind them wind farms if they're offshore and out of sight. Yeah. But, or even maybe, you know, if they're close to industrial areas, fair enough, we're used to that. But they're basically all over the Scottish countryside. You can't go anywhere. I was watching that thing, The Traitors, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. and you've got this beautiful castle they're all in, and you look out and there are the wind farms and this thing. Like yeah, what? big turbines Literally. all over the place. Terrible. Great. Uh, so, po- oh, sorry, for those reasons, uh, Ross Greer is my Zoomer of the Week. Well done, Mary. Right. Well done, Mary. We're going to run a little bit over, just a couple of minutes. If you want to stay with us, that would be great. Uh, next up is going to be my, is my Zoomer. Right, my Zoomer is a special a special shout out to the useful idiots and Scottish Conservatives and Lib Dems who are now fighting on the same side as the SNP. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to show you the video, but basically there are a whole bunch of them, including uh, we have Christine Jardine with a video you can watch, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton and Monica Lennon and other ones in the Labour Party, although we don't care about them quite so much. Basically, um, don't these people know any strategy? They don't, they haven't they seen, you know, how the SNP operate throughout the years. Yeah. Um, the objective, the, don't they know that the main objective of the SNP isn't the rights of the child or trans people, it's, it's breaking up the UK. So when you work one, with them in one thing, it will almost always be subverted to become that other thing. Yes. And um, it was exactly the same when Ruth Davidson decided to fight on the same side as Sturgeon during the Brexit vote. Right, that, and this led to years of um, chaos, chaos since, yep. because this is this picture sickens me actually. It sickens me because you know basically she should have been fighting. Yeah, not you don't go. Oh, my conscience says I should do this, but and but so this fight is a small issue because it's going to be subverted. Well, Brexit wasn't a small issue, but you know what I mean. This narrow issue yeah. because yeah. it's going to, always going to be subverted by the SNP. They because Ruth Davidson. Uh, didn't fight. It meant that the vote in Scotland was much lower uh, to leave. The vote in Leap to Leave was much lower than it should have been. Mm-hmm. And it's led to years of headlines saying Scotland is being pulled out of the EU against its will. It's That's one. But Brexit, I'll just point this out, but Brexit actually means that it's a, it's, if she'd thought about it a bit more, Brexit means a hard border. If they go independent, it means a hard border with the, with the UK, and nobody wants that. So think about more strategy. And the same with Nicola Sturgeon, always going on about a vote for me isn't a vote for independence. And then the next day, after the election, she says, oh, thanks for voting for me for independence. Exactly. Right. Everything is always subverted, right? So mm. how can they not see this all the time? I'm saying here's a simple rule of thumb. Do not, under any circumstances, support the SNP policies because they'll be used against you. Ask yourself, does this thing that I'm supporting have the ability to be subverted by Nicola Sturgeon? The answer is yes. Always. And it's always yes. That's right. And it doesn't matter what you personally think of the issue. She will subvert it anyway. If you can't, it's just it's like a, the snake and the scorpion. It's exactly like that. That's exactly. their nature, yeah. right? Especially never, ever cooperate them on issues that think you make look like a decent person, like trans or child issues. That's how they hook you in. That's how they bait you. They baited these people with this trans issue, and then they turn around and say, Oh, you know, actually, Westminster bad, and now we've got people from the uh, from who should know better, uh, particularly Lib Dems, are also now on the same side. You're like, what, what, why would you do that? So that's mine. Yeah. Well uh, said, good rant indeed. <laughs> so anyway, right, that's it. Um, and Mary, actually, I'm going to get you to choose. Oh, me? Yeah, actually, see. I um, I think this week I am going to go with Maggie Chapman. It has to be Maggie oh, Chapman, yes, yes. which oh, I just yes. type it in and then we can put it up. Oh, it's just oh, it's just a horrible, horrible. I mean, you just see from her demeanor as well. Yep. It's just oh my god. These people need to be out. We don't need to be seeing them on TV. Well, that is. I mean, this is a very years. good point. Some people say just need to vote them out. But who mm-hmm. is voting? These people, this is the thing. What nutters are voting for these nutters? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember going to account uh, 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 from the, the 2021 election, the, the numbers of masses of piles of papers of people voting for SNP, it would really shake your belief in humanity. It's terrifying. The, the sheer volume of people who are voting for them, 
And that's what we've got to do. The one thing we've got to do on this show is persuade people to stop voting SNP somehow, really. Oh, it's no, one of the doing that. We're just part of it, part of many part people of trying to do that. Yes. All right, so Maggie Chapman deservedly wins that. Yes. We will be back with another show next Wednesday. Uh, indeed. Which is, the 25th. which is a famous night, indeed. Yes. Oh, um, yes, yes it's Burns night. That's right. Um, so, thank you to UK Union Voice, Anti United Against Separation, and the other pages that support the show. Thank you so much. And if you can, please donate five or ten pounds monthly. No times are hard at the moment, but it would really help us uh, push forward for you in 2023. And thank you, everyone, for your comments. We had quite a deluge of comments. I was finding it quite difficult to keep up with them, especially at the beginning of the show. So thank you very much. And also, of course, thank you to the Glasgow Cabbie for coming yep. in and uh, being so gracious to talk to us. As I said, you can view the entire uh, interview on YouTube. It should be live now. I'll leave you with the thought of the week, which is related. It's what would you think would happen if ordinary people like the Glasgow Cabbie or us or even you out there didn't stand up against this madness. They'd roll right over us, right, with authoritarian, yeah. incompetent, and literally perverse laws. It's, it's all of our duty to stand up against these extremist policies and keep our country and our children safe from these nutters. Well said. So, anyway, we went a bit long, but thank you for staying with us this time. We will see you again next week. Thank you. It's good night from me. Good night from me. Good night. See you next week. Have a good week, guys. Thanks very much.